Welcome to the Richard Blackby Leadership Podcast, helping people take their leadership to the next level. Brought to you by Blackby Ministries International. Well, it's good to be back on another podcast. Good it always sitting, is, yeah. Sitting across from you, Richard. <laughs> we are finally concluding. You hope. We hope. The epic uh, four-part saga <laughs> that has been Reality 4 for Experiencing God. That's right. We haven't even uh, gotten through all the realities. I just know. Reality 4, we got a little bogged down. Just been a bit of a marathon, but we've had yeah. we've had good feedback. Yeah. Um, you know, some may say, well, you know, what, is, what does all this have to do with leadership? And we would say that it's probably the most important part of leadership is, is hearing from God. And anytime you're leading people, even leading yourself, it's important to know uh, where's, you know, what's the right thing to do, uh, what direction should you be going yeah. in. Cause and this is directly related to that. Exactly. Uh, leaders make decisions. That's one of the most important things they do. And if uh, making decisions is critical to your job, then you want everything possible that will help you make the best decision, the right decision. And certainly if you have uh, the ability to hear from God as the spirit tries to guide you, then you're much more likely to make the right decision. So anyone who makes decisions needs to know how to hear the voice of God. Right. And so that is why this has now (laughs) become a uh, four-part series on reality four of experiencing God. If this is the first podcast you're listening to, we'd encourage you to at least go back and listen to the other um, parts, the other realities Mm -hmm. that we've uh, talked about. Uh, And especially if if this is the first part of listening uh, for (laughs) hearing God's voice. Yeah. (laughs) We'll we'll see if we can cut through the uh, weeds here. But uh, so this is part four. Go back and listen to part one through three. Yeah. Because we we've looked at the fact God speaks through the Bible. He speaks through prayer. He Mm -hmm. speaks through the circumstances of your life. And so the fourth part of that is God speaks through the church. Uh, And uh, and of course, we would say God speaks other ways as well. Uh, Biblically, he has spoken through dreams, visions, uh, you know, many different ways. But these four we would say are perhaps, at least in our day, the, the primary ways God speaks. Right. And also the, the primary ways in which you can judge what you've heard uh, to see if it is from God or not. So these also are kind of a, a, the testing board. So anytime someone comes and says, uh, here's a word from God, these are four different ways you can measure that to make sure that they stand sort of the test of authenticity about being from God. Right. And so today we're looking at the the last part of hearing God's voice, and that is officially it says uh, that God speaks through the church. Um, You might broaden that out a little bit. Yeah. That's how my dad wrote it. Um, And I would maybe expand that just a little bit. Dad was uh, basically saying, if you're seeking a, a clear word from God, then a safe place to do that is in the context of other believers in a church. And that makes and, sense. And that's certainly true. And I think that's the, the primary focus that we would have here. Uh, but I, I would probably just add, you, you could also have just said that God speaks through people because there are times where God may even speak through a non-believer mm-hmm. uh, or someone that's not in your church, uh, the, just the, the, the bigger church, uh, a fellow a fellow Christian. And so that that perhaps is a little confusing. I think uh, the primary focus my dad had at the time was to say, yeah, if you're going to want to hear from God, then uh, you're definitely going to want to be in the midst of a local congregation of other believers who know you and walk with you and uh, have uh, the ability to speak into your life. And so in, so the, in the official book, it says God speaks through the church. And that's where we'll probably focus primarily. But I would just add, God could speak to you through any person uh, that the Holy Spirit chooses to use. Right. And uh, so I guess the the question is, why does does God speak through people? Why not just come to you directly? Like, what's the, where's the advantage in in that? Well, obviously, uh, there are times where we're not... uh, paying as close of attention as we should, or maybe we have heard from God, but we need to confirm that. And so oftentimes when, a, when God speaks to us through a person, 
it's not that we haven't ever heard that before. It's just that it's affirming what we're sensing in our own spirit. Now, yeah. now that others are hearing it as well, we begin to think, okay, this might not just be my imagination and so on. And there, there's a great uh, passage in 1 Corinthians 12 where the Apostle Paul unpacks the whole concept of the church as being a body. And he says, we're all members of it. We're, we're all different parts of the body. And so my dad in Experiencing God gives the illustration of uh, if, you, if you are, for instance, an eye, uh, and, and you're an eye and you're standing on a railroad track looking east. And as far as you see the railroad track extending eastward, there's no trains on it. And so as far as you can tell, there's no trains anywhere nearby. But you're looking east, and the track also runs west. And uh, but the but the ears, they keep hearing this low rumbling sound, and they and the sound gets louder. And your feet keep uh, sensing vibrations on the tracks. And and so although your eyes, if 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 it was based just on what your eyes could see, you would say there's no train coming. Yeah. But when you start listening to what the other parts of the body are sensing, it begins to alert you, well, maybe I'm not aware of all the the data that's coming in. Uh, there's other sensations that as an eye, I'm not picking up, but the ears, the feet are. And so all of a sudden you turn around and now you're looking in a different direction. Now you see what the ears and the feet were already sensing right. and you realize, okay, there's danger here. And so the the point of that is that if we're all parts of the body of the church, that means that we're gifted in different ways. We uh, have a we sense things differently, and and I think all of us have had those experiences where you get in a room with five other people. We may all have had the same experience, but we we experienced it differently. We saw it differently, uh, and and that's why. And there's nothing wrong with that. It, it doesn't mean that one. In fact, Paul says. You know, the members are not superior to one another just because an eye can see and, and an ear can't. That doesn't mean the eye is more important than the ear. They just sense things differently. Mm-hmm. And so in the church, it's the same way. We're, we're wired differently. We sense things differently. Uh, we see in part, not in whole. And so that's one of the reasons why it's so good to have other counselors around you and to be in the church body. Because when, when uh, you're in a body... Now you've got many people who see things a little bit differently. Uh, you're all looking perhaps at the same thing, but you're just sensing it differently, yeah. seeing different parts. And uh, and I think so often uh, we make bad decisions because we've got a very narrow viewpoint of just what we sense. And that now we're, but we're, we're missing a lot of the detail because we haven't heard from other people. Yeah. You know, I think even in my own life, you, you sort of can get this tunnel vision if you are not sort of you know, bouncing your ideas or your interpretation of things off of other people, yeah. you can sort of really come into your own little world and, and really be blinded to the reality of the situation. And so, yeah, that that, that and, really makes sense. And I think just uh, particularly with important decisions you're going to make, you just need to get all the perspective that you can. And, uh, and, and because maybe what you saw certainly would indicate that you should move forward in this decision. But if you'd listened to four other people, all familiar with the same situation, they all would have sensed other things that would have changed your conclusion. But because all you went by was what you sensed, what you could see, you, you, you didn't have nearly all the information you should have had. And there's an interesting kind of corollary to that. And, and, uh, that has to do with being married, uh, my dad often said, uh, when, when you become married, now you're one flesh with your spouse. And my dad would say, so if you're a man, if you're the husband, but your wife is now sensing that God is saying something, uh, sometimes the husband will say, well, my wife really feels we should do this, but I haven't heard God say anything to me yet. And my dad would say, well, you're one flesh. Mm -hmm. That means that if God spoke to your wife, he's also spoken to you. Uh, don't don't discount what your wife or your husband are, is hearing just because you haven't heard that yet. Uh, you're one flesh now, so you've got to take that into account. Now, that doesn't mean that your wife just dictates to you all the time and just says, sure. now God wants you to do this and God wants you to do that. But it does mean that you take what she hears very seriously because you're one flesh now. And if she's hearing something from her perspective and her viewpoint, 
you better get your spiritual senses open and on wide alert because more than likely she's picked up on something from her vantage point that you'll also be hearing if you'll just keep on paying attention. Hmm. Well, that, that's really just powerful stuff. I guess the, the follow-up to this would be, well, I could see people wondering, okay, that that makes sense in, in best-case scenarios, but, you know, the, the Bible's also clear about false prophets. Yeah. Or, you know, not not everyone who says, hey, uh, God told me to tell you X, Y, and Z, like that's not always the case that, yeah. you know, you know, you have some bad actors in there or just, just you know, people who, who maybe don't have your best interest in mind or really uh, don't know what they're talking about. So how, how do you sort of parse the, the actual uh, hearing from God through other people with sort of the crazies, I guess. Yeah, well... Or just, and, just the off-base. They don't have to be... Right. Sometimes they're very well-meaning, very sincere, but I'll tell you what, there's a, been a lot of abuse in this regard. Yeah. Where people in the church came up and said, God told me that you're to do this. You're to serve in the church here. I had a wonderful uh, woman, a single lady, come to me one time, and she said that uh, she was in a church and uh, that uh, there was also a single guy in the church, and... Uh, several of the elders approached them and said, we really believe that it's God's will for the two of you to be married. <laughs> and uh, they, they weren't yeah. dating at the time. Uh, they were their friends. They knew each other from the singles ministry in the church. But, and so, but they, they took that seriously. They thought, well, this must be God's word to us. These are the elders of our church. They, they went on a number of dates and they talked quite a bit extensively just about where they sensed God leading them and what, you know, they were looking for and what they needed. And, and after probably six months of exploring this relationship, they just concluded, I, we just, we, we seem like nice people, but there's just nothing there to indicate we should be married, uh, at that level. And so the, the woman was asking me and said, so what would you do if, uh, the elders of your church came and told you who you're supposed to marry and you just, just didn't feel that that was right. And uh, I probably was a little too crass, but I said, I think I'd look for a different church. Um, <laughs> because yeah. to me, that's uh, there's a certain amount of abuse there, presumption, uh, and uh, manipulation perhaps. Uh, you know, I, don't, yeah. I don't know all the, all the details, but uh, when people clearly say, we know what God's will is for you, uh, there's, you, you do that carefully. I, you, you, there are times I've sensed that I did know God's will for other people too. But even then I was very, I had to be very humble and cautious about how much of that I shared. Uh, in fact, I, I've even told, uh, uh, I, I've t had a talk with a young uh, single woman one time that, uh, she just really believed that this certain man was supposed to be her husband, but uh, that man didn't have the same sense. And, uh, my advice was, well, don't tell him that because all that will do is chase them away. They'll he'll scare yeah. them off. If if truly God's told you this person is going to be your your husband, then it will happen. You just be faithful and you wait. Uh if it's not from God, it's not going to happen. Yeah. But if you tell them, now you're trying to manipulate things. Yeah. You're trying to pressure people into doing what you think God wants them to do, which never works. And so what I would say is if someone comes to you and says they have a word from God for you, there's there's a couple of things you can do. One is beware that there are such things as false prophets. In fact, it's a good thing for people today that we don't follow the Old Testament admonition because that was if someone prophesies falsely and it's proven to be false, uh, put them to death uh, yeah. because it's a, it's a dangerous thing to have people going around saying, thus saith the Lord, when God hasn't had anything to do with that. And so uh, some of the clues that maybe you're dealing with a false prophet, someone that's coming to you with, uh, that they, they claim to have a word from God, but they really haven't. One is if they, uh, well, certainly in the Bible, the, the primary test was, does what they say come to pass or not? Is, does it happen? If they keep saying that this is of God and then what they say never happens, they're a false prophet. They, they're making stuff up. Uh, now when, when I've known people though, that everything that they said, it did happen. 
I tell you what, after a while, you take those people very seriously. Uh, you don't want to discount what they're, what they have to say about you. Also, some people don't just, they don't want to be held accountable. You know, they, if you say, well, wait a minute, didn't the last three things that you say not happen? If, if they get very defensive or if you say, well, where in the Bible do you get that from? Uh, what, what's your scriptural basis for that? And they, if they get defensive, if they put the sort of, if they bully you and, and try to talk like, Hey, we're elders in this church or, uh, who are you? I, I've been a Christian for 50 years. Who, who are you to challenge what I have to say? I'll tell you what I, I'm immediately red flags go up. Uh, if it's very self-centered, self-serving, of course, that's what, how some of the cult leaders, developed. It's like, well, God's told me you're supposed to give me your, your savings. Uh, you're supposed yeah. to support my ministry. You're supposed to just promote things that make me better. If it's very self-serving, uh, I'd get very uh, nervous about that as well. Uh, if, if they put a lot of guilt on you, if someone says, I have a word from God for you, and then they keep making you feel guilty if you don't follow through, um, God does not operate out of guilt. Uh, guilt is just a form of manipulation. If someone has a word from God, for, I've had uh, on uh, an occasion or two a time where someone came to me and they truly sensed that they had a word from God for me. I listened to it humbly. I evaluated the source. Is this person credible? Uh, has and, and in this one case, the person had never shared a word like that with me before. They never have since. But, but in this one time, uh, and they did it very humbly. They did it almost apologetically. Uh, they they felt uh, they were uncomfortable as well. Uh, they they weren't getting any gain from it. In fact, they were probably going to suffer loss from it. Uh, and, and so all of that told me to, to listen carefully, and then then take that word and run it past the Bible. Well, what am I? How does this line up with what God's saying to me in His Word? Uh, I prayed about what they said, and. And, uh, you know, if someone gives you a word from God and then you pray about it and you just have no sense of peace about it, then that would alert me this may not have come from God. But uh, if someone comes with you with a word and then as you pray, you you feel more and more confident that this is truly a word from God, that's certainly also uh, a good sign. So, uh, and I I, I would just say that uh, anytime someone comes or has a word from the Lord for you, uh, look to see if there's uh, a verifying word from someone else. If there's only one person who feels yeah. that way and, and all the other Christian friends and counselors you have, none of them line up with that, then I would, I'd begin to wonder about that and say, well, this one person is only the only person that senses what God is doing and saying at this point. That makes me just a little cautious, uh, if I had three people who all sense that, well, then that would at least make me pay closer attention because there seems to be something here, especially if they're from different walks of my life. You know, yeah. I, I mentioned uh, three elders from the same board, but but if I've got a friend at work who's a Christian, I've got a friend at church who's a Christian, I've got uh, you know a prayer partner somewhere else in a different uh, group of my friends, and and from various walks of my life, they're all sensing the same thing. Well, then that that certainly has way more clout with me. For sure. Yeah. Well, let's take a, a quick break here and then we'll wrap up. Ready to take your leadership to the next level? The Entrepreneurial Leaders Program is a one-week intensive course at Oxford University designed to help marketplace and entrepreneurial leaders develop the skills they need to have a greater impact on their business and community. Don't miss this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to study under Dr. Richard Blackaby and other leadership experts at one of the world's most prestigious academic institutions. This transformational course will run from August 11th through 19th, 2019. For more information or to register, visit entrepreneurialleaders.com. The link will be in the show notes. Richard, I like what you said uh, right before. Well, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there, yes. Don't, uh, I get it right sometimes. Yeah. Uh, right before break, you mentioned uh, having multiple sources uh, from various walks uh, of your life all telling you the same thing that's Mm -hmm. obviously more important than if you just have one lone voice Uh, and so i i really like that sort of the strength in numbers theory that that you know 
don't just take one person, but if but if multiple people in your life are all sort of coalescing around a direction or whatever it is in your life, that obviously more serious. Um, but there's also people who <clears throat> who maybe don't have a great network around them, mm-hmm. or or are, aren't very plugged into their local church or or whatever it is. How do you go about making sure you're around the the people that are gonna speak into your life uh, a word from God? Yeah. Well, several things. One is those people are not going to volunteer. They're not going to approach you and say, "Hey, I'd love to be a counselor to you." Uh, if they yeah. do offer, don't decline. <laughs> uh, so you've got to be in charge of that. You've got to determine how many godly, wise counselors are going to surround my life. You have to enlist them. And you watch for them. Watch for people with a track record. Watch for people that are people of prayer, people that know their Bible, that are regularly in it, that are humble. They're not on power ego trips trying to control other people's lives, uh, but they very humbly just share what it is that they sense. And uh, and if you ask their advice, it's always a great sign if they, instead of simply giving you their advice, they say, let me pray about it. Let me, uh, let me search the scriptures and I'll get back to you. But uh, I would say tr- try to enlist people. And of course, you know, there are people who are, have expertise in different fields. Uh, if you're in, say, a, a business field, you probably want a couple of Christian counselors who also know business. Yeah. Uh, if you're in ministry, you probably want some ministry oriented kind of people uh, is at least part of your counselors. I'd, I'd want to spread it around a bit. Uh, some people that may be very visionary, uh, spiritual sort of people and others that are very hands-on practical, but still people that you, you can trust that what they share with you is coming from uh, God. Uh, and I think the the important thing that you're saying here is people, plural, they, yeah, um, not just one singular yeah. voice speaking into your life. And, you know, probably one last thing I'd just say about that is um, if you ever get tempted, if you're facing a major decision and for whatever reason you you sense that you are not eager to hear other people's feedback, that ought to be a huge warning for you. I could tell you several very specific stories where I knew someone that typically would come by and regularly run things past me. If they were facing different things and uh, uh, in their life and their decisions, or in one case, uh, it was a single person that uh, as they would be dating various people, they they just kind of keep me and my wife informed and what do we think about this and here's how this went and they're not quite sure that this you know relationship will, will be going anywhere and and then all of a sudden uh, they're date they're dating someone but they haven't run that person past you hmm. they boy the, the last four different relationships they bounced it off us and sought our counsel but this fifth one uh, they're, they're kind of quiet about that and uh, what ultimately happened in that case was uh, th- this person had always run things past us before. We always gave them candid, honest, helpful, encouraging, sincere counsel. But then all of a sudden, this person's dating someone that has all kinds of red flags about them. And my wife and I have got lots of concerns about that that particular person. We don't see a fit. We don't see... Uh, the, them going in the same direction. Uh, we don't like the way this person treats our friend, but all of a sudden our friend's not asking us. And uh, mm-hmm. and ultimately uh, it led to a very, very unhappy, miserable marriage. And, uh, and I look back and I think, but you know, why is that? That that was the first time that they stopped seeking counsel. And the bottom line is because they knew what we would say mm-hmm. and they didn't want to hear it. They they wanted to get married and th- they knew us well enough to know we wouldn't uh, agree with a lot of the, th- the things going on and how that person was being treated and they didn't want to be discouraged, dissuaded. So they just didn't ask. Uh, hmm. I've known people that uh, always came to me for counsel about their jobs and their, their work life. And then all of a sudden one day they're just, they're out of the blue quitting and they're walking away and it's like, well, you used to seek counsel for me on all kinds of things. And here your major decision, like quitting your job and you didn't even mention it. Hmm. Uh, well, that sounds to me like you didn't want counsel. You yeah. were, you made up your mind. I am going to quit. I, and I don't want to talk to Richard because he might just talk me out of it. I, I, I so I'm not going to talk to anybody that I fear might 
tell me what I don't want to hear. Yeah. Or if you're in a conflict with someone and uh, you, you, in the past, you've always had counselors help you resolve uh, relational issues, but this time you don't seek any counsel because the fact is you, you're kind of afraid that if you were to uh, talk to your godly counselors, they might point out that you had much to do with the conflict and maybe you needed to apologize or maybe you needed to do whatever was required to be reconciled. And, and you don't want to hear that. You just want to hear what you want to hear. And so um, that's always a, a red flag for me. Uh, if I can keep, no matter what the situation is, always take it back to all my uh, group of godly counselors. And before I make a major decision, run it past them, heed what they have to say, uh, then I'm much safer. Uh, but I tell you what, there'll come a moment where you don't want counsel. You just want to do what you want to do. Yeah. And that almost always leads to a lot of regret later. Well, this is, uh, this has been a great study on the reality of God speaking. Uh, as you can see, I think it's been worth taking the four parts. I hope so. Uh, and I, and I hope, you know, we know that we've heard from many of our listeners that this has been uh, a really impactful study. And we hope that you take away something that, that will help you uh, in your leadership uh, as, as you uh, take the next few steps. So, Richard, we've got a, a, another question that we'd like to get answered from a listener, sure. um, Otto, who is in the Netherlands in Amsterdam, that you say that when God speaks, that is the moment to respond. Well, sometimes I feel that when God speaks, it is not always, uh, it's not always directly the time to act on it, or am I wrong? Could you explain some more about this? Yeah, I, I think uh, I think in in the uh, book Experiencing God, there's a point where my dad b- basically is addressing people that they'll say, "Well, I I know what God wants me to do, but I'm and I'm planning on doing that someday." <laughs> and uh, my dad just kind of says, "Delayed obedient." Once you know what you're to do. Every day that you delay can be an act of disobedience. Mm. And oftentimes we think, well, I intend to, to to obey. I intend to do what God wants. And dad would say, well, once God tells you something, you need to begin responding to that immediately. Now, that doesn't always mean that you'll do every that everything yeah. that God wants happens. You know, God came to Abraham and said, I'm going to make you a father. You're, an, you're a senior citizen, but I'm going to make you a father. Well, he, he doesn't ultimately make him a father for 25 more years, but he does say to Abraham, so let's begin by you moving out of your home country and yeah. going to a land that uh, I'll show you. And so, you know, sometimes what what that means is when God speaks to you, there, there's usually something to respond to about that. It, it might mean that you have to go take classes. It might mean you have to adjust your schedule. It might mean you start praying every day about this. You can just, you can only respond to as much as God has shown you so far. Right. And, uh, you can only respond as much as you're capable of doing at that moment. It, you, you may not be able to do everything that God's put in your heart yet, but you're shifting your heart and getting yourself in a position to respond to everything that you can respond to. So I would, I would say that there's sometimes God will give you a little bit longer view of where he's taking you. You know, maybe God says, uh, I want you to be a pastor of a church, but uh, you're going to have to finish university first and go to seminary and maybe uh, get some experience. Uh, but I'm letting you know where I'm going to have you end up. And that there's lots you can do about that. You can enroll in university and get started. You know, you can right. start uh, finding ways to serve in your church now to get experience. Uh, it's not that there's nothing you you can do. Uh but to get to the end of all that may take several years. So, uh, so ask yourself, what can I begin doing now in light of what God's already revealed to me? And at least make sure whatever you can do, you are doing that much right now. And, you know, it, it may be just nothing more than just praying. I mean, when, when, when the angel first comes to Mary and says, you're going to give birth to a, a Messiah, it's like, well, <laughs> what do I do with that? Yeah. You know, she's just, some of that, she's just pondering in her heart, you know, and just saying, well, God, she's beginning to think and pray and search her own heart and make sure she's ready to be the mother of the Messiah. But sometimes there's not a lot you can do except just make sure that you are personally ready uh, to, to obey. So, mm-hmm. you know, trust in God's timing, though, I would say just uh, normally when God tells you something he wants you to do, 
that you that often is his timing. If he wanted you to do it five years from now, he'd tell you five years from now. If he's telling you now, and it's within your power and control to do it now, my first instinct is then to say, well, if God told me now, he probably wants me to respond now. Just get in the habit of responding as much as you can to what you know God's already told you to do, and just keep a real short account um, on in your response time so that you don't wait years to get around to doing what God told you to do years earlier. Great. Well, we'd encourage you to keep the questions coming. Yeah. Uh, we always love tackling some of these questions, and uh, Richard always likes a challenge. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the podcast. If this is something you enjoyed, review us on Apple Podcasts, and don't forget to subscribe and share with your friends. If you have questions or comments, please email us at podcast at blackbee.org.